Hi everyone, uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on integrating your new renewables in the grid. We're broadcasting from Quebec City, Canada, and our presenter Christian will take over shortly. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So, a good afternoon uh, if you're listening to us uh, from uh, Europe or Africa. So, uh, it, we are. It's a pleasure for us once again to have you all uh, with us uh, this morning to for this new webinar about uh, integrating uh, renewable energies. So, once again, I have my faithful uh, friend here at the uh, as the co-pilot uh, Francois Xavier will be there to help me with uh, the cameras and answering your questions uh, and uh, either answering directly your questions if it is a question for one from one person that that is only of interest for one person or uh, relaying these inform these questions to me so I can answer for everybody so uh, welcome again and uh, while we are uh, waiting for everybody to connect, uh, I will ask you to answer a couple, a couple of uh, polls that we have prepared for, for you to, uh, to better align the presentation to your background. So the first poll that you will see there is uh, to know if uh, how much you know about these uh, technologies, so solar power and wind power that we are about to look at today. Uh, once again, for those of you who participate for the first time in one of those webinars, I warn you that some of you, unfortunately, will not be able to answer. There is a bug with the interface with some computer, some computers that you are not able to, to click on an answer, but most of you should be able to enter. So, uh, are the answers coming in, uh, FX? Yeah, we have uh, more than half of the participants that voted at this time. And uh, what does it yield as a result? Uh, somewhat is the most popular answer with 83%. Excellent, excellent. Perfect. So then let's go to the second poll. So it's for me to know, uh, as you know, the systems that we propose here at the uh, Festo Didactic are uh, it's, it's, uh, systems that are to be used in laboratories to teach uh, specific topics to your students. And uh, these topics that we are looking at today uh, are one of them. Uh, and I would like to know if some of you are teachers for these topics. It's almost half and half so far. Excellent. So we like to have many teachers because you are our main uh, aim when we build they build this these systems it's you and your students that we have in mind so uh, hopefully this will be a useful presentation to you perfect so let's start with a uh, quick presentation of the company and then we will uh, dive into the uh, main topic for today so let's switch to the powerpoint please thank you so uh, the agenda for today, uh, you, you have on the screen there. Uh, so first, uh, we will have a quick presentation of the company. Then uh, how we will look at how we design our training solutions to make sure that they are the best suited to, uh, to your needs. And then we will dive into the topic itself, which is renewable energies integration in the grid. So first of all, we will look at wind power uh, technology, then solar power, and finally, how to integrate these in the grid. Uh, there will be two demos. In fact, there is only one appearing there on the, uh, in the agenda, but there will be two uh, specific exercises that we will do throughout this presentation. And we will end with a period, period of questions. 
So first of all, quick history of Festo Didactic. So the history of Festo Didactic is related to the history of Festo, Festo Automation, uh, which is the industrial uh, player that provides uh, industrial solutions to our customers. So this company, or Festo, was founded in 1925 by Mr. Stoll in Esslingen, uh, which is uh, close to Stuttgart in Germany. So, uh, and it, initially it was founded to provide uh, woodworking tools uh, to the industry. Then in 1955, a new technology uh, appeared, which is uh, pneumatics, and Festo decided to uh, develop its expertise in pneumatics and started providing pneumatic solutions to its industrial uh, customers. In 19, 1965, Festo realized that uh, its own employees needed to be trained on these new technologies and they decided to found Festo Didactic, uh, which is the didactic branch, educational branch of Festo, to train uh, technicians in uh, technical fields. Then in 2014, so uh, five years, six years ago, Festo uh, Didactic and LabVault uh, merged and uh, LabVault was a Americano-Canadian company uh, that was uh, in existence since the 1950s, uh, providing its own educational solutions, mainly in the electrical engineering field. Uh, so the merge with Festo provided a much larger portfolio with both uh, automation and electrical engineering uh, solutions. And finally, in 2020, uh, today, uh, Festo Didactic is a major player in the uh, technical education field in the world, in automation and industry 4.0. So here are the some of the fields, the, the large fields in which we have uh, expertise uh, in uh, didactic equipment, so factory automation, process automation, fluidics, uh, building automation, electronics, uh, electric power, uh, HVAC and refrigeration, telecommunication, and finally in the center there, environment and renewable energies, which is what we will be discussing today. Quickly, uh, just so you know who uh, is talking to you. So the building you see there is the building from which we are broadcasting this morning. It is uh, this afternoon for you. It is uh, located in Quebec City in Canada. And this is where uh, the offices are and also where the manufacturing plant is located for all the, the systems that are built in uh, Canada. Uh, on the right, you see the training team. So, uh, Francois Xavier, you can come and say hi, Francois Xavier, who's with me here this morning. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, pleasure to be here. Also, my colleague Gonzalo is watching. He says hi to us. Ah, okay, thank you, Gonzalo, who's uh, the one on the left in the picture, and me, uh, the little one on the on the right. And finally, uh, the picture in the center, Mr. Mathieu Plourd is the product manager for the line of products that we will be presenting today. Okay, so uh, let's see how we design our training solutions at uh, Festo. So since we are providing uh, educational uh, solutions to teachers, we want to make sure that our products will allow the teachers to reach exactly the goals that they set, uh, which is the educational goals that they have set for their course. So to be sure that the equipment will allow it, uh, allow us or allow the teachers to do it, we always start from the learning objectives. So first we will uh, ask teachers and industry specialists and our, our own Festo expert, what are the topics, what are the goals that should be reached by this new training system that we are thinking about. Then we will ask our technical writers to write lab exercises uh, that will allow to achieve these, uh, these goals note that at this time there is still no equipment existing okay it's only the technical writer saying okay we would we should be able to achieve these goals with these exercises then based on these exercises we will come up with equipment specifications learning system strategy and then only then we will build the hardware and finally the technical writer who was re responsible for the initial lab exercises will make sure that the equipment that was built fulfill his needs and uh, write the final version of the manual so this way you are sure that the manuals the equipment uh, are perfectly aligned with the educational goals Okay, so let's dive into the main topics for today, renewable energies integration in the grid. So uh, for the system that you see in, uh, behind me here is our uh, CE certified uh, European version of our classic uh, um, 
of our classic EMS training system. And uh, it provides all the courses that are required to teach renewable energy and how to integrate it in the grid. So if we go back to the slide, you will see that uh, the system is broken down, in fact, can be bought in uh, different packages depending on your needs. So uh, there is the solar power and the wind power uh, topics that are covered with, uh, with the system. So you can buy just the basic of both, so basic solar and, or basic wind. Then you can buy, you can have the advanced solar and advanced wind, which are in fact integrating these energies into a residential or uh, into the grid. Or you can buy the complete package for solar and wind, uh, which will provide you with the basic and advanced. And of course, you can buy the whole uh, package, solar and wind, uh, basic and advanced. And that's approximately what I have behind me here is the whole package plus a few modules uh, that, are, that are not shown because they're not required for the exercises today. Okay, any questions before we dive into wind power effects? So far, so good. I think everybody's listening. Perfect, thank you. So wind power. So first of all, I will present you a, uh, an excerpt from the manual that covers this, this topic. So the name of the manual is Introduction to Wind Power. And you will see that in comprise, it comprises four exercises. So typically our manuals will contain between two exercises for the most, uh, the simplest uh, uh, topics to 15, 20 exercises, depending on the topic. So this one here at four exercises, uh, each exercise comes with its uh, theory uh, and then the uh, lab protocol for the student to be able to achieve the complete exercise by himself or herself. So the protocol is really detailed as you will see in a moment. So if I can go back to the slide, thank you FX. So uh, as you can see, uh, four exercises, one that treats uh, voltage versus speed characteristics of a wind turbine, then torque versus current characteristic, power versus wind speed, which is what we will do together today. And finally, storing the energy into batteries. So here, just a few screenshots taken from the manual, uh, some images taken from the manual. So typically the manual is really detailed, lots of written theory you know, for each exercises, but here in this PowerPoint, just to show you the kind of topics that we are covering, I took a few meaningful pictures. So first of all, we introduced the student to uh, how to calculate the energy contained in the wind. So of course, uh, the amount of energy that we will be able to extract from the wind is dependent on the area, uh, the cross surface area of our of the blades of our rotor, uh, of our wind turbine. So uh, the larger uh, the, the cross sectional area, the larger the blades, uh, the more power we'll be able to extract. And of course, it is related also to the speed of the wind. So we, we also introduce the student to the equation uh, that allows calculating the amount of energy uh, of power contained in the wind, which as you can see is based on the cross-sectional area, the uh, speed of the wind at the power of three, and the, um, the, wind, the air density of the air. Then we introduce the student to the topic of uh, maximum power. So how can we make sure that we extract the maximum power of the wind at what speed, at what the current and at what the voltage is uh, this, uh, this point reach and how to do the following, the, follow, how to follow or track the maximum power point. So uh, this is also presented to the students. Again, this is only a small, small excerpt of what you will find in the complete manual. Now, let's look at the equipment itself. So what you have there, uh, you can see on the picture before we zoom on the real equipment behind me, uh, is the combination of our four quadrant dynamometer, which acts uh, on the picture, you see it on the left. Uh, so the four quadrant dynamometer is a, a DC motor control, computer control that allows us to uh, emulate all sorts of things. So in this case, we will ask our dynamometer to emulate a wind turbine. And then you can see that with the belt, it is, uh, with the uh, timing belt, it is attached to the uh, the wind generator, the, the turbine generator itself on the right. So let's switch to the real system here. So 
So if you can zoom on this, please. Thank you. So as you can see, as you saw on the picture, so I will just show you here that we can easily, of course, remove the timing belt. Like this. Unlink the two units. And I will show you here on top of our turbine generator what you can find here, like this. So. Uh, so you see here that we have the three-phase output of our generator. This three-phase output can be fed here in the three-phase input of our uh, charge controller. So this will convert the uh, three-phase power into uh, three-phase voltages to a uh, DC voltage to send to the battery to charge the battery. Okay, And with this knob, we can control the maximum voltage that we don't want to go over in the battery. But you can also use the three phase output, send it to our diode bridge here that will convert it to DC to power a, a DC load. And finally, you also see that there is a thermistor that can be used to monitor the temperature of the generator. This will be displayed in our computer interface as we will see uh, to make sure that it's not overheating. And finally, the unit needs to be powered. So you see you have some power connections here that I will use in a moment. We'll just put back my timing belt here. Like this, make sure that it's properly tied. And as you can see, there is a safety cover here that needs to be put in place for uh, the system to work. If the safety cover ever uh, is removed, everything stops moving for safety reason, of course. For this to work though, the unit needs to be powered. So uh, I will need to connect power cable to my unit here. So I will present to you uh, quickly these modules in an instant, but let's say that here for the moment, I have this 24 volt AC uh, module that provides me with 24 volt voltage that I can connect here to power my wind turbine and its safety cover. Okay, so uh, what we will need for this uh, specific experiment that we are about to do now on top of the four quadrant and the uh, wind turbine generator are a few modules that you can see in the back here. First of all, I told you that the four quadrant was a, a DC motor computer controlled. So this is this unit here is the motor and this unit here, you can see that it is, it is connected with this wire to a module here. So this module is the uh, electronic control for the motor. So that's why they are connected here. So this unit is powered uh, and we will see that it can work in many different uh, modes. Uh, so right now, in fact, these two cables are not, uh, are not required. This will be for a following experiment. So right now I will be using it as a dynamometer in dynamometer mode to uh, to emulate a wind turbine for my uh, gen my generator. The unit can be controlled from the faceplate here, or it can be controlled from the computer, as we will see in a moment. Uh, on top of that, what, what we will need is a module that will allow us to uh, acquire the uh, voltage and currents in our uh, in our system circuit. So this is our data acquisition module that you can see here which comprises four voltmeters, uh, four volt, uh, voltage input, four current inputs. And uh, we will be able to monitor that, digitize it, and send it through USB to the computer for it to be displayed and analyzed. So as you can see, two modules need to be uh, connected to the computer, the four quadrant and the data acquisition module. And that's what I will do right now. Perfect. So uh, I will just now complete the circuit that you will see now on the screen. So this is the circuit that we will uh, achieve here. 
for this exercise. So as you can see on the left, we have our prime mover, which is our four quadrant dynamometer, uh, connected mechanically to the rotor of the uh, generator. Uh, the three phase, the three coils of our generator that is fed <laughs> yeah, it shuts off after after a while. <laughs> we had just lost our our light. Um, so the three coils of our generator feeding our diode bridge, rectifying it to DC, and then the DC output going through an ammeter, uh, the voltage of which is measured by a voltmeter, and feeding a variable load here. So speaking of variable loads, I will now present you our load module. So you can switch me back to, thank you, uh, here. So uh, this is our load module. So resistive load, we have also capacitive and inductive loads like these. So the resistive load module provides us with nine resistors in three banks of, uh, in three banks of three components so that we can have a three phase load. Or in this case, since I only need DC, I will have a single load. That's why I connected all of them in parallel here so i have the option of using up to nine resistors in parallel to change the value of my load so that's what i will use now first switching everything off so infinite resistance initially okay so leaving let's finish the connections here So leaving the positive terminal of my diode bridge, I will go to I4 input, which is my four, my meter four. The other ones are used for the next experiment. Out of the ammeter, I go to my load. And from the load, I go back to the negative terminal of my diode bridge. All I need now is my voltmeter. So I will connect my voltmeter here at the output of the ammeter and back to neutral. So I will measure the voltage at the output of the diode bridge. So good, we're ready to launch the four quadrants. So now we will switch back to the computer where I will use our software, LVDAC EMS, that allows me to control uh, these modules and monitor what is happening in the circuit. So when you launch this software, uh, you have the choice to run it in connected mode or demo mode. Uh, why is there a demo mode? It's simply because this software is available for free. And in fact, the FX will provide to you the address on our website to be able to download this uh, software. Uh, so of course, when, the soft when your computer is not connected to any of our modules, uh, you cannot run the software in connected mode, but you can still run it in demo mode. Uh, and in this case, it will show you everything that is available, all the function sets, all the, uh, the different functions that are available with this software. So it will be a good way for you to explore the capabilities of the software. In my case, of course, I want to use the connected mode here. And when, uh, when I launch that, the software checks which units are connected to the computer right now. So it tells me that it has found a data acquisition and control interface uh, module connected and the four quadrant dynamometer connected also. So perfect, my two modules are detected. Here I select my local network voltage and frequency. So 2050, 2050, 2050. So I will use 2050 here and click OK. By the way, this is not our network here in Canada, of course. Our network is 120 volts, 60 hertz. But uh, the unit I am showing to you here is our European unit. So uh, I am using our 50 volt uh, uh, circuit that we have in the building here to uh, 50 hertz, sorry, uh, 220 volt. Uh, circuit that we have to power my unit. So when you launch the software, 
uh, you have this uh, empty screen where you can select many different instruments. So let's start with our meters. So as you can see, uh, there are 18 different meters that can be used uh, concurrently. Uh, initially, eight of these meters are pre-configured to display the four voltages and four currents. In our case, we only need E4 and I4 here for the moment. So I will just turn off the other, other meters here and leave this one there. And I will also bring my well, in fact, the oscilloscope now is no use here because what we are monitoring is DC, so it's not really interesting. We will use the oscilloscope in the, the coming uh, exercise. Now I need to bring my dynamometer control window to control it, to ask my dynamometer to behave like a wind turbine. So you will see here that there are multiple functions that it can implement. It can uh, force a specific speed or a specific torque on a motor. It can do a full speed sweep or it can emulate many different things. So for example, it could emulate a flywheel. So the motor thinks that it is connected to a flywheel. It can emulate a grinder, a fan, a calendar, blah, blah, blah. But what we are interested in here is the wind turbine emulator. And when we select this function, let me bring that up here. Uh, you will see that we have controls on multiple parameters. Of, of course, the wind speed, the maximum wind speed you can set is 12 meter per second. The air density uh, in kilogram per square me cubic meter. Uh, the wind turbine type that you want to emulate, is it a three blade, uh, the, depending on the second, oops, yes, in this version, there's only this one um, wind turbine type, which is of residential, typical residential wind turbine and the pulley ratio between the two pulleys of my uh, dynamometer and uh, wind turbine. Perfect, so I will just set, well, I will leave it at five to start with, and I will start the uh, the function. I will ask if FX, that's it, to have a close view, thank you, on the wind turbine, so you will see it speed up. So we can see that we are currently at 65 volt. Uh, whoops, let's switch that to DC here. Yes, this is DC. So 65, 65 volt DC at the output of my diode uh, bridge. Uh, and of course, if I play with the speed here, you will see the voltage increasing. So I'm up to 100 volt at the output of my uh, DC, uh, my diode bridge. And of course the current is still null because as I told you, um, the, uh, the resistance is for the moment infinite. Uh, you can see here in this window, various other parameters. Yeah, let me make that bigger here. Well, I don't know if you're able to see the numbers at the bottom here. But uh, you can see that uh, there are various parameters uh, about the, the generator that is provided. So the speed, it is speeding at right now. So we see that we are almost perfectly on the synchronous speed, uh, 1500 RPM for a, a four pole uh, asynchronous motor. Uh, the torque is almost zero because again, there is no current uh, flowing and uh, the power, okay? So now I will start increasing the resistance, the load, and you will see how this impacts. Thank you. So I am slowly increasing the load. We will see the current that will start increasing and the torque also will start increasing in the software. And we will see the speed dropping as I increase the load, of course. So we are now up to uh, almost uh, 
200 uh, milliamp, milliamp. Keep increasing. You see the torque increasing also up to uh, 0.4 Newton meter. So now with my full set of resistance here, uh, which is something around uh, 400 ohms, uh, I have a current of uh, 0.4 amp uh, running in the in the circuit in the uh, in my turbine, my generator also. Unfortunately, I cannot go lower because I would need another module uh, to have a lower resistance. But still, it, we were able to understand the principle. So. With uh, the combination we have here, uh, in fact, what we ask the students to do in this exercise is uh, to do exactly the setup, try different wind speed with different loads, and uh, for each wind speed, they will have to trace the uh, torque versus speed characteristic that uh, you see, or the voltage, current versus voltage uh, characteristic uh, that you see on the screen there. So they will have to repeat that for multiple uh, different uh, wind speed and multiple different loads. So just to show you if I can have a close-up view on the motor uh, on the generator, thank you. Now I will shut off the wind turbine emulator and you will see how quickly it stops because of course the torque is uh, is not uh, negligible on the uh, on the generator because of the current flowing through the generator. So uh, this is the goal of this first exercise. Of course, I go really quickly here. You can understand that with all these tools that we provide to you, uh, with all these tools that we provide to you here, you can explore at will with your students uh, various characteristics of the circuit. And to this goal, we provide you here with uh, all these meters that can display not only voltage and currents, but of course they can display anything else that can be calculated from voltage and current. So from this uh, menu here, you will be able to uh, set a meter to display the current, the voltage, the power, the efficiency, impedance, power factor, frequency, torque, speed, ratio, uh, and phase shift. So all of phase angle and phase shift, all of this can be calculated from voltage and current. So it can be displayed in the software here. Okay. That was it for the first demonstration here. Uh, FX, do we have any questions? Hi, Christian. Uh, there is no question per se, but uh, I want to say that I put the link to the download of LVDAC EMS in the chat window. Actually, it's the link to uh, for, for the data acquisition. You go to the bottom of the page, and that's where you can get the free software. Thank you, FX. So let's move on to the next part of uh, the presentation. If I can uh, get my PowerPoint here. So next part was about solar power. So let's dive into solar power. So the course on solar power on PV cells, PV cells itself and PV modules comprises seven exercises, as you can see here. So uh, first we present the diode because it has it is linked to the uh, working principle of a PV cell. Then we look at the PV cell itself at the photovoltaic panel. Uh, then we look at the effects of temperature on the solar panel performance, the effect of shading, the effect of the orientation of the sun and the effect of the insulation of the sun. And finally, there is an exercise also about how to store the energy uh, provided by this panel into batteries. So again, just a few excerpts, a few images taken from our manuals uh, to show you the uh, amount of details that we provide there. So first covering uh, the photovoltaic cell, the equivalent circuit, uh, the symbols, uh, how they can be connected, how, how these mod, uh, a module can be built by connecting multiple cells in series and in parallel, depending if you want more voltage or more current. Uh, the symbol used for a photovoltaic module, the uh, current versus uh, voltage uh, characteristic curve to find the maximum power point. So the students learn how to find the maximum power point for a, a PV module. Uh, the impact of uh, illumination levels on uh, the uh, performance of the panel, 
and finally the panel itself so now we will switch again to the camera for me to show you our our unit here So this is our uh, solar panel and it's a test bench that you see here. So I will first unconnect my solar panel from here to show you just the panel and then we will go to the test bench. So the solar panel here, as you can see, it's really small you see the size of my hand here. So this solar panel is, uh, let's say it right from the start, it's uh, really not powerful. It provides only two watts of uh, power because the goal of that is not to power anything in your classroom. The goal of that is for the students to understand the working principles of a, uh, a PV, uh, PV cells and PV module. And to this, this goal, it's much easier to have a small panel like this because it's easier to power it to exploit its full potential. So to be able to get two uh, watts out of my panel, I can easily do that with 200 watts of light, which is easy to achieve in a classroom. If I was to have a 200 volt, a 200 watt uh, solar panel full size, I would require 20,000 watts of uh, light in the classroom to power it, which is not really uh, feasible. So that's why we decided to go with the, this small format. So here you have two modules, one upper, one lower modules, and these modules can be connected either in series or in parallel for the students to explore this and this is achieved through the connectors at the top here so you see that the student has the two connectors to connect them in series or in parallel directly from here we also provide them with a uh, reset a variable resistance okay to be able to find the maximum power point and we also provide them with uh, diodes three diodes to be able to uh, uh, bypass a module if it is uh, in the shade and it's not producing energy anymore or to prevent uh, the uh, batteries to uh, discharge through the solar panel at night. So uh, all of this is covered, of course, in the manual. And finally, at the back here, you have the uh, heat dissipator to keep the uh, PV uh, modules at constant temperature. And we will see that in our test bench, we have a fan blowing on these fins to keep the temperature down. A small digital thermometer, which is also constantly available here. This module is self-contained. Uh, this module is self-contained and uh, you can do all of the exercises uh, in the manual just with this. If you uh, have a separate source of, uh, of sun, if you want to go outside uh, and use it uh, with a separate uh, light source, no problem. We provide you with a tripod uh, mount here so you can fix it on a camera tripod and go outside in the sun. And to this aim, we provide you also with this uh, little uh, sundial here rings, sundial rings on the front so that you can evaluate from the shadow projected by a little mass that you put here, you can evaluate the orientation of the solar panel to the sun. But if you want to be able to work uh, independently in the laboratory uh, without uh, being dependent on the external conditions, you will come here and put this in the test bench. So the test bench provides you with a halogen, halogen lamp in the back here that uh, lights on the uh, PV uh, panel. And it provides you with a fan here blowing on the fins to keep it cool. You have control on uh, on both the light and the fan from here uh, because we want to the, the student to test what happens if the temperature rises. So in this case, we keep the fan off and they can see that the performance of the panel goes down as the temperature increases. And finally, you have a control for the illumination here, of course, uh, on falling on the PV panel. Any questions? Uh, up to now effects on this PV module? Uh, not on the PV module. I see that Gonzalo is suggesting using uh, LVSIM EMS too, if you want to get acquainted with uh, the training equipment. Uh, and... Yes, except that, uh, yes, I, uh, I can present LVSIM EMS. So we have to be aware that LVSIM EMS does not allow uh, the, does not cover the renewable energy courses. So what I am uh, presenting today uh, is not uh, available per se in LVCMEMS, which is the simulated version of uh, 
of what we're looking at here. Uh, we have a simulator that allows uh, performing many exercises on this uh, system. Uh, well, on the, uh, let's say, North American version of this system. So the look is not the same, but the modules are, are the same except that uh, many of what we will see today is not available in this uh, in this simulator, unfortunately. So that's why I am presenting it to, to you with the physical hardware system. Okay, so I'm just making some way here for the second exercise, which is not yet yet. So uh, I decided not to present to you any exercises on the PV module itself. Uh, it's quite uh, self-explanatory. We turn on the light, measure the voltage, measure the current, uh, shade, put, uh, put a shade on uh, one of the cells, see the impact on performance. So uh, nothing that is, uh, that is uh, exciting, but it's really, uh, really uh, useful for the students to understand all these principles. So I prefer the, keeping my time to show you uh, how to integrate these energies in the grid uh, by looking at our photovoltaic systems manual. So the photovoltaic systems uh, manual corresponds to the advanced package I was talking to you about. So now that we have covered uh, the working principles of a PV cell, let's look at how to connect uh, a PV uh, module or solar pa PV panel in a residential uh, home energy production system, a home energy production system. So uh, the content of this uh, manual, four exercises, standalone PV system for DC loads, uh, use of a maximum power point tracking charge controller in a standalone PV system, uh, standalone PV systems for AC loads and grid tied PV systems. So four experiments, two, three hours each, which is typical. All of our experiments are designed to take uh, a typical lab period, which is about two hours. So uh, here you have right from the start with this package for uh, lab period covered. Uh, again, some excerpts from the manual. So standalone PV system showing uh, how a PV panel uh, with a power control uh, conversion device will be able to charge a battery and power DC loads locally. So the DC loads are connected directly to this because the battery is providing DC power. A uh, typical connections in a house with the PV panel on the roof, the charge controller, uh, the PV panel connected to the charge controller, which charges the battery here and which provides power to all the DC loads in the house. Uh, how these, uh, this system works uh, during the day. So while there is sun, uh, of course, the current is going into our charge controller, charging the battery while providing also power to the loads because we suppose that the sun provides us with more power than what is required by the battery. So some of it goes to the load, some to the battery. And at night, of course, no more currents here, no current flowing to the PV panel because there is a protection in our charge controller for that. So the battery is providing the full power to the load. Uh, in all these charge controllers, you have a battery over discharge protection. So to make sure that the battery does not get discharged too much. So we present this topic also to the students. Uh, what happens in the module when the voltage gets to a certain level in the battery uh, and uh, reach to recharge the battery as required. So with AC loads, when we have a system with AC loads, we can see that we have initially the same portion, except that here our battery is not connected directly to the loads, but goes through an inverter here that will uh, produce AC power from the DC power of the battery and uh, power the AC loads in the building. So now is the time for this, uh, this demo. Uh, that will look something like this. So the demo I will be doing here today is the uh, standalone AC system. Unfortunately, I'm not able to provide you, to show you the grid tied version and I will explain to you in a moment. Uh, but uh, here are the modules that we will need. We will use again our four quadrant dynamometer, but this time we will use it as a solar panel emulator because it can provide, uh, it can provide all sorts of AC and DC output. So I will use it as a solar panel emulator because I cannot use my two watt solar panel. It's not powerful enough. Uh, this will go to the charge controller, maximum power point tracking charge controller, which will charge the battery 
and the battery will be connected to the standalone inverter to power the AC lamps. And you can see that this is our modules and they perfectly reflect a typical installation in a house with the solar panel, the charge controller, the inverter and the battery here. Okay, so this is the uh, setup that we will uh, use and I will show you how the connections that I already have done here uh, reflect that. So if you can give me both the uh, schematic and Perfect. So in the schematic, we see that from the solar panel, we go to the uh, MPPT charge controller. So my solar panel, I told you, will be implemented by the dynamometer here, the power supply dynamometer. So for this to happen, I need to switch my dynamometer to power supply mode. So it can act as a dynamometer or power supply. So I switch it to power supply mode here. And the output of uh, my power supply will be these two terminals here. So I will take my two cables going to my charge controller here. Like this. So from my emulated solar panel, I go to the charge controller. From the charge controller here, which is a commercial one, as you can see, this is not uh, uh, our own uh, manufactured by us. It is a standard Victor, Victron Energy uh, charge controller the same that the students, the future technician will find in, in, the, uh, in the, on the market. So uh, the output, the battery output of my charge controller is connected here to our battery module. So we have a 48 volt battery module here. Uh, so four uh, cells of 12 volts each that are connected in the series that I can turn on and off and I can check the current voltage level on the battery with this this button here. So I'm at 49 volt right now. So that's it. And also from the batteries here, I am going to a first ammeter to measure the amount of uh, current go coming out from the battery. And from there, I go to the inverter here. So this is my inverter at the battery input of the inverter. And the output of the inverter is going to I2 to measure the current coming out of the inverter. And from there, it's going to our loads here. So these are our AC loads. So I have three different kinds of uh, light bulbs, uh, standard uh, incandescent, one uh, CF uh, uh, fluoro compact uh, uh, bulb, and one Dell. Okay, so we will look at the impact of the different types of loads that we use. So globally, this is our setup. Of course, we have also voltmeters to measure the voltage at the output of the charge controller and at the output of the inverter. So let's switch back to our software. Okay, so I will turn off these two meters, turn on E1, I1, and P1. So I want to measure the power voltage, current, and power at the input, uh, at the output of the charge controller and the, uh, at the output of the inverter. So one is in DC. This is the output of the charge controller. And the other one is AC. By the way, you can see here that uh, the power that we measure can be the active power in watts, the reactive power in VAR, and the apparent power in volt ampere. This is of no use for the demonstration today, but just to let you let you know that you have this control. I will bring back my oscilloscope here because now it will be interesting to look at what we get out of the uh, inverter. And for this, I will monitor E2 and I2, the voltage and currents at the output of the inverter. like this. Finally, I need my window to control my uh, dynamometer. And now you will see that I don't have the same options as before because I'm now in power supply mode. So I want it again to behave like an emulator and I want the solar panel emulator function. So if I make that bigger here, so you will see that we have control on the amount of PV modules that we want to have connected in series and in parallel. 
6 and 30 being the, uh, no, 10 and 42 is the maximum. Uh, so here in this case, the exercise specifies to use 9 in series and 16 in parallel. Uh, and you can also specify if you want the solar panel orientation control to be automatic so that we simulate a solar panel mounted on a base that can turn to always face the sun or if you set it to manual. <laughs> Just as I do that, we lose the sun. Um, if I set it to manual, you can see that you will be able to specify the sun. At, whoops. Uh, you will be able to specify the sun altitude. No, I think it, you just need to press it again. Uh, sun altitude and azimuth, and uh, the solar panel tilt angle and azimuth also to be to be sure that you are pointing towards the sun. But for this uh, simple uh, demo, let's use the automatic orientation here. Perfect. So now I can start my solar panel emulator. Oh, can, you can also control, of course, the illumination of the sun, 1000 watt per square meter being the maximum available on the planet Earth. So this is the maximum you can get also here. So now that I have this turned on, you will see that I will get a voltage reading at my battery here. Well, first of all, I need to power. Yes, sorry. I need to power to to turn on the battery. So uh, to put the switch here, this powers my charge controller. So the charge controller is now telling me that uh, there is a uh, there is a battery connected here, but it has no uh, no sorry, it's not blinking. So now it is charging my battery. So that's probably what I see on the screen here. Yes, so E1 is a 57 volt. This is the output of my charge controller. No current because there is no load for the moment. And E2 is all at zero, the output of my inverter because nothing is on yet. So if we turn on a load here, uh, first of all, I need to power, yes, the inverter. So when we turn on the inverter, it checks that there is power available at the battery input. And if it does, uh, the status LED turns green on the side here telling me, okay, I'm ready to work. I have power available. So now I can turn on a first load, which is my incandescent li light. And now you can see that the output of the, uh, of the, vo of the uh, inverter is 233 uh, volt AC, a current of 0.24 amp for a total power of 57 watt, which is good because this is a 60 watt bulb, so uh, fine. And of course, if I turn on additional loads, so the three loads in parallel, we will see that the voltage remains the same, so uh, the regulation is quite good. It's able to maintain its voltage no matter the load. Uh, the current has increased to 0.35 for a total power of 77 what? So uh, if we look at the oscilloscope here and ask for the auto scale, okay. So in yellow is our voltage at the output of the inverter. So we can see that it is really well filtered. Uh, we don't have any of the uh, residues of the uh, of the uh, IGBT's trigger firing in there. Uh, but uh, we can see that the current is really distorted. And of course it is to be expected because right now we have a, a compact fluorescent light and a Dell in the circuit, which distort the current quite a lot. So if I turn off these two, you will see that the current is now perfectly sinusoidal with our uh, incandescent light being the only load of, uh, on the circuit. So the students are asked to look at this, the impact of the uh, shape on the uh, waveform of the current, uh, the impact of using a uh, incandescent light versus a Dell, which provides the same amount of light for a much lower consumption, only nine watts. So this is to make the future technician realize that yes, there is a huge uh, importance of selecting a uh, really economical, uh, so energy saver uh, loads when we have a standalone PV system like this. So globally, that's the uh, what I wanted to cover with this demo. Any questions, uh, FX? Yes, we do have a question here from Philip. Uh, it is uh, what what 
Can we integrate the 46106 solar wind with EMS? Solar wind for 46100. 100 yes. probably, yeah. It's, uh, so the solar wind. Well, in fact, that's a really good uh, question. And yes, you could, because in fact, with the uh, with the EMS, uh, as long as you uh, can, you give my, give me back the camera, please. Uh, so with the EMS, as long as you uh, uh, you don't go above the specifications of the equipment, uh, there is no problem. So. Uh, our uh, data acquisition here is able to withstand up to 800 volt of input uh, up to, uh, well, sorry, yeah, this is the European version. So yeah, it's still 800 volt and uh, 25 amp maximum current. So if you don't go above that, you can use it as uh, use this as your monitoring device on, on the 46100 definitely. Um, and you could use the charge controllers and the inverters here instead of the charge controller and the inverters that is provided with the 46100 also. Uh, I don't know what would be the goal, but well, in fact, this is this charge controller is uh, uh, have, uh, more modern than the one that is provided on the, the 46100 with the maximum power point tracker. Uh, you could also use the battery, but the battery on the 46100, uh, and you could use, of course, these loads also, but this is a, as you can see, there are m many things that replicate what the 46100 already does, except that we go more deeper in the theory with this system here in the manuals. We go deeper in the theory than uh, we did with the 46100, which was more for the installation technician, how to connect things together. This here is more for the electrical technician who needs to understand what is happening in these, in these modules and also learn how to connect them. But uh, thank you for this uh, really good question. Uh, is there another question? Okay, because I realized that there is one thing I, I, I still owe you. I told you that I would explain to you why I was not doing the grid tied experiment, which is in, included with this, uh, this uh, system. So you can see we have two inverters with the system, this one here, which is standalone, and this one here, which is a grid tied inverter. Okay, so this inverter here, uh, to be able to work needs to be controlled by a gateway, okay? So the gateway, which is here, uh, you only need one of these gateways in the whole classroom, by the way, because it will detect all of these uh, inverters that are connected on the same circuit uh, and will allow you to monitor them from here. So uh, this gateway need to be, needs to be able to, to talk to these uh, inverters that are connected. And here in Canada, since our network is uh, 60 hertz and not 50 hertz, we have to generate our own 50 hertz here in the building using a generator. And because of that, this generator does not provide us with a really stable frequency. So it's fluctuating a little bit between 49.5 and 50.5, which is not precise enough for the uh, use of this inverter because the inverter monitors that the grid is uh, is really at a precise frequency, okay, uh, before being able to connect with the grid. So if the grid is not stable enough, it will not connect. And because of that, we cannot do this experiment here uh, in Canada because of this, this problem we have in our building. But I assure you, I tested the system in Germany and it works perfectly fine. And in fact, when you first configure the, uh, the inverter, you can specify which country you're in because uh, the company provides a database and it knows for each country what are the specific requirements of stability in voltage and frequency that are that is required to be able to connect to the grid of this country. Uh, and with this module that you can connect to your computer, you will be able to monitor the amount of power that was produced by each of your uh, inverters, uh, the amount of energy that was exchanged with, uh, with the network. Uh, all of this can be monitored from the uh, software interface of this gateway uh, module here. So that's really convenient. And we go through all of that in the exercise about grid tied uh, system. No more questions? We're right on time, 10 o'clock. So uh, thank you for attending. Well, maybe just one, a few uh, last seconds to for you to answer this last poll. So I would just like you to tell us if this uh, webinar was of use to you so that we know uh, if uh, there is anything that we can do better to, uh, to suit your needs. So please answer this last poll before leaving. And once again, I remind you that 
we have other upcoming webinars so tomorrow in the afternoon which would be a bit late for you if you are in Europe uh, but we have another uh, webinar on uh, process control uh, and next week uh, we will have additional webinars uh, what is it now next week no in two weeks from now uh, anyway I think you have the whole schedule I don't have it by by heart and I, my mind but uh, look at the schedule so every two weeks we have these webinars on different topics so thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you in the, the future bye bye have a good day